The stars are right, and that means it's time for another episode of The Whisper in Darkness. I'm your host, The Man from Lang. Thank you very much for joining me today. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the patrons of this channel for their tremendous support. The Arkham Horror LCG community is amazing, and these people have gone above and beyond to bring you content like these Deck Tech episodes. If you'd like to support the channel's goals and see your name on this list, head over to Patreon.com, sign up for a tier of your choice, and claim your rewards. That would be awesome. Without further ado, let's get started. On this episode, we're attending a lecture by one of Arkham's oldest, most distinguished professors, Harvey Walters, an investigator for the Seeker class released in the Investigator Starter Deck product. I'll share my thoughts on Harvey, explore his viability in the multiplayer and solo formats, and examine some of the player cards that are included in his starter deck. By the end of this video, I hope you'll be better prepared to ace Harvey's course on non-Euclidean mathematics at Miskatonic University. There are spoilers throughout if you care about that sort of thing. If you enjoy what you hear, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Will Harvey's lectures shed light on the nature of the mythos, or will they bore players to tears? Let's find out. Harvey Walters is among the oldest, if not the oldest, investigator in the history of mythos-related gaming. Harvey originated in the first edition of the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game in 1981, where he was a sample investigator used to illustrate the character creation process and the game's mechanics. I first encountered Harvey and his unfortunate companion Kurt when I picked up the fourth edition of the role-playing game in 1989, and Harvey has reprised his role as the sample investigator in every edition since, including the seventh edition of the game that was released in 2015. Harvey appeared in the original Arkham Horror board game, which was published by Chaosium in 1987, and every Arkham Horror Files product released by Fantasy Flight Games. Harvey is the original investigator, so I was looking forward to seeing how designer MJ Newman would interpret him for the Arkham Horror LCG, and she did not disappoint. Harvey Walters, the professor, has four willpower, five intellect, one combat, and two agility. He has the Miskatonic trait, seven health, and eight sanity. Harvey has the following response after an investigator at your location draws one or more cards from their deck during the investigation phase. That investigator draws one card, limit once per round. Harvey's Elder Sign effect is plus one, draw a card. Harvey Walters' base skill values are typical of an intellectual seeker whose goal is to investigate the mythos from the safety of a university campus rather than the heart of a steamy jungle. Harvey's advanced age and experience have taught him a thing or two about controlling his fear, which is reflected by his above-average willpower. Harvey has an advantage against common willpower-based treacheries such as rotting remains and frozen in fear from the core set. Harvey lacks the mental discipline of a highly trained mystic, though, so he'll still need to commit cards and or resources to deal with treacheries such as Crypt Chill and the Yellow Sign from the core set, Arcane Barrier and Visions of Futures Past from the Dunwich Legacy, or Centuries of Secrets from the Circle Undone. Willpower skill tests are required by some parlay actions, and they also appear on Agenda and Act cards from time to time. Harvey's above-average willpower is helpful during these types of skill tests, although he'll likely need to commit additional cards and or resources to pass them consistently. Fortunately for Harvey, his starter deck includes one card with multiple willpower skill icons, Arcane Enlightenment, as well as cards such as the Seleno Fragments, Encyclopedia, and Higher Education that can modify his base willpower. Harvey's highest skill value happens to be the most important skill in the game, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, playing an investigator with 5 intellect is, play, is like playing an entirely different game of Arkham Horror LCG. An investigator with 5 intellect has such a huge advantage that the rest of the card could be blank, and I'd probably still play them. Intellect skill tests during investigate actions become a breeze at all but the highest shroud locations, and you can often race through a scenario before the encounter deck has a chance to put up much of a defense. The question is not whether you'll discover clues when you take an investigate action, but how many clues you can discover with one investigate action. Harvey's starter deck includes several cards, such as the Seleno Fragments and Witten Green that can raise his intellect to 6 or 7, while Extensive Research 0 and Deduction 0 can help him discover additional clues. Intellect is critical to investigate actions, and it is also tested by many parlay actions, Harvey is a gentleman and a scholar who will have little difficulty enlisting the aid of Jazz Mulligan in extracurricular activity, gathering vital clues about the King in Yellow from Constance Dumaine in The Last King, or persuading Ishtaka that he is not her enemy in The Untamed Wilds. There aren't that many treacheries that test an investigator's intellect, but Harvey is in a far better position than most investigators to deal with cards such as False Lead from the core set, Ephemeral Exhibits from the Miskatonic Museum, or Black Star's Rise from the Path to Carcosa. 
Harvey's experience and advanced age do wonders for his willpower and intellect. The same cannot be said for his combat and agility, both of which are below average. Below average combat and agility aren't a significant liability in multiplayer, since there's usually at least one combat-oriented investigator at the table who will happily take enemies off Harvey's frail hands. However, enemy management can be a significant problem for Harvey during a solo campaign. Up until recently, Seekers have had very few options at level 0 to deal with enemies. The situation has improved slightly with the release of cards such as Bloodrite in Before the Black Throne. Harvey's starter deck contains two more enemy management options, Disc of its Amna Zero and Occult Invocation. Encyclopedia Zero can also be helpful in a pinch, although it does require an action to trigger, which would open Harvey up to attacks of opportunity. Unfortunately, Harvey's below average combat and agility skill values also make him vulnerable to several, several common encounter cards. A simple locked door from the core set has the potential to become an impenetrable barrier for Harvey, while Grasping Hands has the potential to deal a significant amount of damage to him. Needless to say, escaping Entombed from the Forgotten Age will require a Herculean effort from our fragile professor. Scenarios such as the Essex County Express, Undimensioned and Unseen, and Curtain Call have all sorts of nastiness in store for Arkham's less agile investigators, and Harvey will be lucky indeed if he can make it through the Forgotten Age campaign without falling off a rope bridge or succumbing to a snake bite. There is only one parlay action that tests either combat or agility, Nashed the Priest of the Dreamlands from Beyond the Gates of Sleep. However, it's a difficult test for Harvey to pass unless he has a trick up his sleeve. Harvey's response isn't as flashy as some of the other special abilities available on Seeker Investigators, but it ranks among the most powerful in the game. Draw wins games, and Harvey's ability to draw extra cards each turn is unmatched. In the multiplayer format, Harvey can use his response to help other investigators at the table dig that much deeper into their decks for the right tool for the job. Is the Guardian or Mystic in the group missing that key weapon or spell? Harvey lets them draw additional cards each turn so they can find it that much faster. The ability to draw extra cards isn't that common outside the Seeker card pool, so having an investigator at the table who can feed card draw to other players from the word go gives a group an edge against the encounter deck. If you're playing Harvey in the solo format, then he gets to keep all that additional card draw for himself, which is fantastic. Harvey may trigger his ability in, re in response to taking a vanilla draw action during his turn, but the ability also synergizes with a wealth of other cards in the Seeker card pool. For example, he may use it in conjunction with assets such as Dream Enhancing Serum, Feed the Mind, and Old Book of Lore, events such as Bloodrite, Cryptic Research, and Preposterous Sketches, and skills such as either level of Perception or Eureka. If Harvey uses any of these cards on his turn, he gets to draw an extra card, and all those extra cards mean he has extra options to counter the machinations of the encounter deck. Harvey is capable of drawing so many cards so quickly that he can exceed his maximum hand size if you're not careful, forcing him to discard some of those hard-earned cards during the upkeep phase. Fortunately, Harvey's starter deck contains several cards that let him not only boost his maximum hand size into double digits, but also reward him for maintaining a so-called big hand. Big hand decks are a relatively new concept in the Arkham Horror LCG since there weren't that many cards to support the strategy until the Dream Eater cycle. The premise of the deck is simple. Use cards such as Vault of Knowledge, Laboratory Assistant, and Dream Enhancing Serum to jack your hand size into double digits, and then draw like a madman, cycling through your deck rapidly while abusing powerful cards such as Knowledge is Power. A good example of this type of strategy is a Mandy Thompson deck by, built by Qherdir, which is capable of cycling through the draw deck multiple times per turn once it's up and running. While this strategy is extremely effective in either solo or multiplayer, Qhadir's deck contains 45 experience points worth of cards, so it's the type of deck that you either play in standalone or the type of deck that you build towards, not something that you play at the beginning of a campaign. It's also worth noting that many of the cards in the deck are on the optional list of taboos because the designers recognize that uh, they were a little overpowered. Harvey's starter deck may not be capable of cycling itself several times per turn, but our professor is no slouch in the big hand department. Between his signature asset, Vault of Knowledge, Laboratory Assistant, and Arcane Enlightenment, Harvey can have 10 plus cards in his hand during his turn. While testing Harvey, I added Dream Enhancing Serum from A Thousand Shapes of Horror to the mix, and I routinely had 12 plus cards in my hand within a turn or two. 
I often had so many cards in my hand that I felt spoiled for choice how to respond to threats from the encounter deck. When you've got that many cards in your hand, you can start to feel nigh untouchable whether you're investigating, fighting, or evading. Sadly, Harvey is not immune to danger once he amasses a fistful of cards, cycles his deck, and begins abusing powerful events such as knowledge is power. Beyond the Veil, a common treachery from the Dunwich Legacy can put the kibosh on those types of shenanigans very quickly. Harvey has a surprising amount of health for a fragile old man, but uh, even he will be hard-pressed to mitigate 10 damage. Cards such as Crypt Chill from the core set can whittle away at Harvey's key assets, while Laboratory Assistant is fragile at only one health. Even basic weaknesses such as Amnesia from the core set and Drawing the Sign from the Path to Carcosa can spell trouble for Harvey, although he is in a better position than most investigators to recover from these types of setbacks. Harvey pings himself for a horror each time he cycles his deck, but uh, that shouldn't be much of a threat given that he has 8 sanity and access to plenty of high sanity allies who can soak the horror for him. The biggest difference between running a big hand strategy and Harvey and another seeker investigator such as Mandy Thompson is his signature weakness, Thrice Damned Curiosity. Mandy's signature weakness, Shocking Discovery, forces her to draw an encounter card which may or may not have an impact when she cycles her deck. As we shall see in a moment, that is not the case with Thrice Damned Curiosity, which can easily kill Harvey if he cycles his deck too rapidly. If Harvey didn't draw enough cards with his response, his Elder Sign ability gives him a chance to draw even more. Remember that if Harvey pulls an Elder Sign during a skill test on his turn, he can trigger his response too, drawing a second card. This didn't happen all that often for me during my games with Harvey, but it is a nice option if Harvey is preoccupied and can't find the time to squeeze in some type of draw action on his turn. Harvey gets plus one to his modified skill value if he pulls an Elder Sign, which is the same for all of the investigators in the starter decks. That's not all that surprising, considering Harvey is primarily focused on discovering clues. Harvey has a base intellect skill value of 5, which uh, becomes 6 or 7 with a few key assets in play, so it's not like he needs a big boost from the Elder Sign during investigate actions. Unfortunately for Harvey, pulling an Elder Sign won't be enough to save him if he can't muster enough skill icons during more challenging combat and agility skill tests. Vault of Knowledge is the type of signature asset that uh, does everything that Harvey could ever want. First, it boosts Harvey's hand size, providing a cushion for all those extra cards that he's going to draw during a scenario. Cards that increase a player's maximum hand size are few and far between, so this ability is a welcome one, especially if Harvey wants to lecture to allies other than the laboratory assistant. If that isn't enough, Vault of Knowledge rewards Harvey for doing what he does best, that is, investigating and discovering clues. Of course, this ability gives Harvey yet another opportunity to, tr to trigger his response and draw an additional card. The nice thing about Vault of Knowledge is that Harvey can share that draw with another investigator at his location, facilitating the development of their board states. Guardians, Rogues, Mystics, and Survivors have received a few more ways to draw cards since the core set days, but Seekers still monopolize the mechanic. Harvey is unique in that he can share some of that draw consistently with other investigators at the table, which makes him a valuable support investigator in addition to being a top-notch kluver. Harvey's signature weakness is Thrice Damned Curiosity. It has the flaw trait and the following revelation, for every three cards in your hand, take one damage. Harvey Walter's signature weakness is Thrice Damned Curiosity. It has the flaw trait and the following revelation, for every three cards in your hand, take one damage. Harvey can draw a ton of cards, which is fantastic. The downside of all that draw is that he will also see any weaknesses that are lurking in his deck more frequently. Thrice Damned Curiosity is the weakness that keeps Harvey honest. Harvey can draw so many cards so quickly that he has the potential to cycle through his deck multiple times during a scenario. Thrice Damned Curiosity makes you think twice about doing that. Harvey has a lot of health compared with many of his Seeker counterparts, but he really does need that extra health to absorb the blow from his weakness, which has the potential to kill him outright depending on the number of cards in his hand when it pops. Now, I was lucky while testing Harvey and Thrice Damned Curiosity rarely hit for more than one or two damage, but then uh, I wasn't necessarily trying to maximize Harvey's hand size in every game either. Still, that one or two damage was enough to kill Harvey at least once, so Thrice Damned Curiosity does command respect. If you pursue a big hand strategy, which the starter deck encourages you to do with cards such as Vault of Knowledge, Arcane Enlightenment, Laboratory Assistant, and Extensive Research, then Thrice Damned Curiosity will likely tag you for anywhere from 3 to 5 damage, 
which is a significant chunk of Harvey's health. If Harvey has 10 plus cards in his hand while cycling his deck, Thrice Damned Curiosity will almost certainly kill him unless he has a way to mitigate that damage. If Harvey is tackling scenarios such as the Essex County Express or Curtain Call, which can ping investigators for a significant amount of damage unless they are extremely careful, the odds of Thrice Damned Curiosity landing a lethal blow rise dramatically. Damage mitigation and or healing is rare in the Seeker card pool, so Harvey's best bet is to pawn off that damage from Thrice Damned Curiosity on one of his unlucky allies from Miskatonic University. Harvey's starter deck includes one basic weakness that is designed to harass bookish investigators like him. Obsessive has the flaw trait and the following revelation. Place Obsessive in your threat area. Forced, when you, your turn begins, discard one non-weakness card at random from your hand. You may take two actions to discard Obsessive. Obsessive is a Jekyll and Hyde type of weakness. On the one hand, if you're playing a big hand style of deck like Harvey, Obsessive is a relatively minor nuisance. On the other hand, if you're playing a deck that doesn't draw that many cards or struggles in the card draw department, it can be a dreadful brute that will shred your hand, leaving you battered and bloody in its wake. Let's take a closer look at both sides of Obsessive. If you draw Obsessive as your basic weakness when you're playing a big hand deck, it's somewhat irritating, but you could do far worse. When I was testing a big hand Harvey build with Vault of Knowledge, Laboratory Assistant, and Dream Enhancing Serum, I had so many cards in my hand most of the time that randomly discarding one of them at the start of my turn to Obsessive simply didn't matter all that much. Sure, Obsessive would discard something important from time to time, but it rarely posed a significant setback. If I had 10 plus cards in my hand after the random discard, then I usually had an answer to almost anything the encounter deck could throw at me. Sometimes I'd just let Obsessive sit in my threat area because I had better things to do than take two actions to discard it. If you're drawing enough cards turn after turn to neuter Obsessive's random discard, one of the best ways to deal with it is simply to beat the scenario as fast as possible. Given Harvey's 5 intellect, he is quite capable of doing just that. If, on the other hand, your deck plays a lot of cards or commits them to skill tests as fast as you can draw them, Obsessive is a huge pain in the ass. If your deck doesn't have a good draw engine, then you will usually end up drawing Obsessive during the upkeep phase, which is the worst time to see it. I hate when I draw a weakness rather than a card that could potentially help me next turn at the best of times, but Obsessive is doubly painful because it will discard another card at random from your hand before you have a chance to deal with it. If you don't have that many cards in your hand to begin with, the odds of Obsessive sniping something important rise dramatically. Lose the wrong card at the wrong time, and you could quickly find yourself in a no-win situation. But Obsessive isn't done turning the screws because you need to take two actions to discard it. If you don't have two actions to, s to spare because you've got more pressing matters to attend to, Obsessive will loiter in your threat area, ripping cards out of your hand turn after turn, which could be devastating. In this type of situation, Obsessive is a very nasty weakness. If you draw Obsessive as your basic weakness in this type of deck, my advice is to remove it from the threat area as quickly as possible. The fewer cards you discard at random, the better off you'll be in the long run. Now that we've analyzed Harvey's strengths, weaknesses, and signature cards, let's examine Harvey's viability as a multiplayer and solo investigator and break down the contents of his starter deck. If you're new to the game and picked up the Harvey starter deck to play with friends, I've got some good news for you. Harvey is a great multiplayer investigator and his starter deck is perfectly suitable for your first campaign. I do have a few nitpicks with the starter deck, namely the lack of support for combat and agility skill tests and the implementation of the big hand strategy, but most of these issues are relatively easy to fix. Much like Nathaniel Cho's starter deck, the Harvey Walters starter deck goes all in on its strategy of choice, in this case investigation, leaving him relatively defenseless against combat and agility skill tests prompted by enemies, treacheries, or locations on the table. Harvey's starter deck contains only 2 combat, 3 agility, and 5 wild skill icons, which will make it difficult, if not impossible, for Harvey to pass combat and agility skill tests with any consistency out of the box. Unfortunately, Harvey's starter deck is missing two Seeker staples, I've got a Plan Zero and Mind Over Matter Zero, which would help him a lot in either multiplayer or solo formats. While I can understand the omission of I've got a Plan Zero, since the starter deck assumes that Harvey won't be taking that many fight actions in multiplayer, Mind Over Matter Zero is sorely missed because it would really help Harvey deal with not only the odd enemy, 
but also the occasional combat or agility skill test that occurs during his turn. I'm glad the deck includes I've Got a Plan 2 and Mind Over Matter 2, which Harvey can purchase once he earns a few experience points, but they don't do him much good at the beginning of a campaign. Besides, I'm not crazy about the idea of spending anywhere from 4 to 8 experience on these upgrades when the level 0 versions of I've Got a Plan and Mind Over Matter usually suffice. Fortunately, Mind Over Matter 0 is available in the core set, and I wouldn't hesitate to add one or two copies to the deck immediately. I've got a Plan Zero, which is in the Miskatonic Museum Mythos Pack. It's a tougher call. If you're playing with two or three other investigators, or you're paired with a ruthless killing machine, such as Nathaniel Cho, you can probably get away without it. Otherwise, I might err on the side of caution and try to include it, if at all possible. The implementation of the Big Hand strategy in the starter deck is also somewhat problematic. Cards such as Vault of Knowledge, Arcane Enlightenment, and Laboratory Assistant really encourage you to boost your hand size to double digits so that, so that you can reap the rewards of cards such as Seleno Fragments, Forgotten Tome, Higher Education, Extensive Research, and Farsight. A larger hand size also helps mitigate the drawbacks of Obsessive. However, in my experience, I found the Big Hand strategy as presented in the starter deck to be somewhat slow since you need to play a lot of assets to have at least 12 plus cards in your hand. Moreover, I'm not entirely convinced the payoff is for amassing 12 plus cards in your hand is worth it. That leaves you with a couple of options. The first is to abandon the Big Hand strategy altogether. I've played Harvey with and without the strategy, and honestly, it's a little bit easier to play the deck without obsessing over your hand size. Your second option is to improve the strategy's consistency. Fortunately, there is a relatively easy fix. Dream Enhancing Serum, a seeker asset from A Thousand Shapes of Horror, is perfect for this deck. It has the potential to boost your hand size more than most of the cards in this deck, and it synergizes nicely with Harvey's draw ability. I would highly recommend buying the Mythos Pack or borrowing a couple copies of Dream Enhancing Serum from a friend. I think you'll find the deck runs much smoother with it. While the Harvey Walters starter deck is perfectly suitable out of the box for multiplayer, I wouldn't recommend playing it in solo. It simply lacks the tools needed to protect poor Harvey from the dangers of the Mythos. That said, once you expand your collection, Harvey's 4 willpower, 5 intellect, and draw ability make him a tremendous solo investigator. I have beaten some of the most difficult scenarios this game has to offer with Harvey in the solo format. There aren't that many good ma enemy management options in the Seeker card pool at level 0, but once you gain a few experience points, there are some fantastic options whether you prefer to fight or evade. The Harvey Walters starter deck contains a wealth of new Seeker cards that work well with not only Harvey but also other Seeker and off-class Seeker investigators in the card pool. I've tested Harvey against a variety of scenarios as a solo investigator, so most of what I have to say here will focus on the viability of these cards in that format. You can divide the level 0 cards in Harvey's starter deck into 6 groups, draw, hand size maximization, resource generation, clue discovery, tomes and cards that interact with tomes, and enemy management tools. I'll discuss potential purchases and upgrades later in this video. The first group of cards support Harvey's special ability, drawing cards. Forbidden Tome 0, Feed the Mind 0, Laboratory Assistant, either level of Wit and Green, Vault of Knowledge, and Preposterous Sketches provide Harvey with so many options to draw additional cards during his turn that he should rarely need to take a basic draw action to trigger his response. I'll discuss Forbidden Tome and Wit and Green a little bit later, and Preposterous Sketches has been around since Blood on the Altar, which uh, leaves Feed the Mind 0. Feed the Mind Zero is a downgrade for Feed the Mind 3 from the Depths of Yoth Mythos pack. It's a lot like its level 3 counterpart, with the exception that it costs one more resource, the intellect skill test is slightly more difficult, and the card draw is capped at 3. The two cards are so similar that I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of players forego the level 3 version altogether. While the prospect of drawing 3 plus cards with Feed the Mind is very tempting, it does require an action to play, an action to trigger, and a successful skill test, uh, which can and will go wrong from time to time. I went back and forth on this card for a long time before trimming it to one copy and ultimately cutting it from my deck altogether. In my experience during testing, Preposterous Sketches requires fewer actions and resources and produce basically the same effect. If you're interested in playing a big hand deck, I'd recommend playing with both cards to see which one you prefer. It's entirely possible your answer will be one, both, or neither, depending on how you've constructed your deck. 
The second group of cards help Harvey maximize his hand size. Harvey can amass a big hand of 10 plus cards by playing a combination of Arcane Enlightenment, Laboratory Assistant, and Vault of Knowledge. If Harvey happens to get all three assets on the table, he can have a maximum hand size of 14, one shy of the 15 required for the plus one intellect bonus on Seleno Fragments. I've already discussed the power of Vault of Knowledge, and Laboratory Assistant has been a staple since the Dunwich Legacy, which leaves Arcane Enlightenment. I consider this to be the weakest card of the bunch, and it's pro the primary reason I recommend picking up Dream Enhancing Serum from A Thousand Shapes of Horror Mythos Pack. I like the two willpower skill icons, since the starter deck lacks guts, but I think the card is too slow and offer offers Harvey too little in the solo format. If I want to increase Harvey's hand size, I'd much rather play Vault of Knowledge, Laboratory Assistant, and Dream Enhancing Serum, which has the potential to ramp up your hand size far higher than Arcane Enlightenment. I cut Arcane Enlightenment for two copies of Dream Enhancing Serum, which made an immediate impact, because it enables Harvey to have 10 plus cards in his hand without Vault of Knowledge or Laboratory Assistant in play, and it gives him yet another way to trigger his response. Dream Enhancing Serum is such a perfect fit for Harvey that I'm surprised it wasn't in, reprinted in his starter deck. Arcane Enlightenment also provides an additional hand slot for a tome, which is okay I guess if you're playing the starter deck straight out of the box. Harvey does have plenty of tomes from which to choose, however if I'm playing solo I'm not all that interested in wasting a card, two resources, and an action on a card that doesn't have an immediate impact on the board state. Besides, if I want to play a deck based around Tomes, I'll just play Daisy or her par parallel version, who can leverage Tomes so much better than Harvey. Arcane Enlightenment may be worth playing in either of those investigators, since you can dump Daisy's signature weakness, the Necronomicon, into that additional slot. I'd also consider playing a copy of Arcane Enlightenment in Minte Fan, since she could use a hand to hold the King in Yellow. There are two cards in Harvey's starter deck that generate resources, Burning the Midnight Oil and Cryptic Writings, the cost curve of Harvey's deck spikes at two resources, so the extra resource generation is appreciated. You'll also need those extra resources if you're planning to leverage higher education. It's uh, kind of odd that Harvey's starter deck actually contains more resource generation than the Rogue starter deck, but uh, that's a problem we'll address when I break down Winifred's deck in a future deck tech. Burning the Midnight Oil is similar to Clean Them Out and Sneak By from the Nathaniel Cho and Winifred Hebemach starter decks respectively in that it rewards Harvey for doing what Harvey does best, investigating. It goes without saying that Harvey is going to take a lot of investigate actions in multiplayer or solo, and Burning the Midnight Oil simply hands you two resources for doing so. Piggybacking resource generation on another action is terrific, and Burning the Midnight Oil has become a staple in many of my Seeker decks for that reason. I've had an on-again, off-again relationship with Cryptic Writings and its level 2 upgrade. Currently, we're on the outs. Theoretically, Cryptic Writings works similarly to Burning the Midnight Oil, piggybacking resource generation on card draw. The problem is I never seem to draw Cryptic Writings during my turn, even when I play an investigator like Harvey who draws a ton of cards. Maybe I've just been unlucky, but Cryptic Writings' inconsistency, coupled with the fact that I really hate taking an action to play Cryptic Writings if I don't draw it during my turn, really bugs me. Long story short, I haven't been playing Cryptic Writings in my Seeker decks lately, but uh, that could change. The fourth group of cards help Harvey discover clues. Deduction has been around since the core set, which leaves Extensive Research 0, a downgrade for Extensive Research 1 from the Dark Side of the Moon Mythos pack. Extensive Research 0 is similar to Working a Hunch from the core set, the obvious difference is being that it's not fast and its exorbitant cost is conditional on your hand size. If you have 12 plus cards in your hand consistently, then extensive research will save you an action at a high shroud location. Discovering two clues without making a skill test is also a great option at locations where investigate actions have the potential to trigger dangerous effects. I'm looking at you, haunted keyword from the Circle Undone. Or tricksy locations such as Arkham Woods Cliffside or Arkham Woods Tangled Thicket from the Devour Below scenario, which force Harvey to investigate with agility and combat respectively. Unfortunately, extensive research prices itself out of the market the moment your hand size falters. I'm not sure how much I'd be willing to pay for extensive research to discover two clues, but I can't imagine that it would be more than two or three resources unless the game was on the line. I took this card for a spin in the Harvey Walters deck I played during the Farkham Knights Iron Man event, but I don't think I ever played it. 
More often than not, my hand size would dip and extensive research zero was simply too expensive. Extensive research one would have been a better option. The fifth group of cards are tomes and cards that interact with tomes. The starter deck comes with three tomes, Seleno Fragments, Encyclopedia Zero, and Forbidden Tome Zero. It also includes two cards that interact with tomes, namely Arcane Enlightenment and Wit and Green. I'm a little surprised that Harvey's deck contains so many cards that focus on tomes, considering the Arkham Horror LCG already has one investigator who specializes in them. Two if you count Daisy's parallel version. Unfortunately, Harvey lacks Daisy's special ability to trigger a tome for free each turn, so triggering tomes will eat away at his precious actions. Harvey might be able to make these tomes work in multiplayer, but most of them are too slow for solo play, and I quickly cut them during testing. Daisy, of course, has a much easier time leveraging these tomes. Seleno Fragments Book of Books is a cheap source of extra intellect and willpower skill icons if you're playing a big hand style of deck. While testing Harvey, I routinely had 10 plus cards in my hand to qualify for the intellect and willpower skill bonuses. I was never able to hit 15 or more cards in hand for that extra plus one intellect though, and uh, honestly I'm not sure the payoff is worth the risk since thrice damned cur curiosity has the potential to hit you for a whopping 5 damage if you're holding that many cards in your hand. Seleno Fragment's role in the starter deck is like that of Magnifying Glass from the core set. Personally, I prefer the Magnifying Glass because it's fast and the plus one intellect skill bonus is unconditional, but uh, Seleno Fragment's is a perfectly acceptable option if you're playing the starter deck right out of the box. Encyclopedia Zero is a downgrade for Encyclopedia 2 from the core set. Encyclopedia 2 sees play in the multiplayer format because an investigator like Daisy may trigger it with her free action to give herself or another investigator at her location plus two to a skill of their choice until the end of the phase. That bonus is fantastic whether that investigator is planning to investigate, fight, or evade. Encyclopedia 2 isn't quite as good in the solo format since triggering it will provoke an attack of opportunity unless you use Knowledge of Power, which isn't included in the starter deck, and has since been added to the optional list of taboos. The other drawback from targeting yourself with Encyclopedia is that in most circumstances the skill bonus will apply for only two actions, not three if, you're the target of, if you target another investigator. Daisy, as always, is the exception. The only significant difference between Encyclopedia Zero and its level 2 counterpart is that it uses secrets, which limit how, you may trigger, how often you may trigger it. However, the card enters play with 5 secrets, which is quite generous, and secrets have several ways of adding more secrets if necessary, including the ubiquitous astounding revelation from the Dream Eater's Deluxe Expansion, so upgrading to Encyclopedia 2 isn't that urgent. Harvey's starter deck includes one untranslated asset, Forbidden Tome Zero, and two upgrades for it, Forbidden Tome Dark Knowledge and Forbidden Tome Secrets Revealed. I'm a big fan of the untranslated assets. Most of them are relatively easy to identify or translate, and the upgrades for them tend to be well worth the effort. That said, I'm disappointed by Forbidden Tome Zero. First, Forbidden Tome Zero and both its level 3 upgrades are intended exclusively for a big hand style of deck. If you're not playing that style of deck, then there's really no point to playing either level of Forbidden Tome. Second, Forbidden Tome Zero takes a lot more actions to translate compared with other uh, unidentified assets. For example, identifying either Strange Solution or Ancient Stone takes only two actions, one to play the card and one to identify it. Interpreting the Dream Diary takes three actions, while translating the Archaic Glyphs takes four. Forbidden Tome Zero is the most labor-intensive card of the bunch, since you need to take six actions to translate it. That is a lot of work unless you're playing Daisy, especially in the solo format where time is of the essence. Unfortunately, Harvey's starter deck doesn't include cards like Knowledge's Power or from Union and Disillusion, or Eldritch Sophist from In Too Deep, which could speed up the process significantly. There is also a small chance that you can get stuck while translating the Forbidden Tome Zero, since you can't remove the last secret from it unless you are certain that you will have at least 10 cards in your hand after you draw. Now, this shouldn't be an issue if you're playing a big hand deck, However, you could end up in a situation where your hand size dips, forcing you to draw without triggering the tome for fear of getting stuck. Both upgrades for Forbidden Tome Zero are geared exclusively toward big hand decks. Unless you're holding 12 plus cards in your hand or you play Knowledge's Power, you've got to spend 2 plus actions to trigger them, and neither of effect is worth more than 2 actions, much less 4 in most circumstances. 
Cards that force investigators to jump through a bunch of hoops before they become useful tend to be slow and cumbersome, and the upgrades for Forbidden Tome Zero are no exception. Forbidden Tome Dark Knowledge lends itself to the multiplayer format. It gives Seeker investigators like Harvey a way to heal themselves or an ally while damaging an enemy at their location. There are some interesting tricks that you can pull with this tome in multiplayer. For example, if a Seeker is paired with a Guardian, they could trigger Forbidden Tome Dark Knowledge to move one damage from Beat Cop 2 or Agency Backup to an enemy at their location. Then the Guardian could use the free triggered ability on either card to deal another damage. Dealing two damage for the cost of one action is a pretty good trade. If you need to discover clues rather than deal damage, the combination also works well with either level of Great Wagner from the Nathaniel Cho starter deck. If a Seeker is paired with Sister Mary, they could move one damage from Sister Mary's signature asset, Guardian Angel, to an enemy, then Sister Mary could assign more damage to the Guardian Angel, adding more blessed tokens to the Chaos Bag. Don't forget that you can use the Tome to move damage to an enemy with the aloof keyword, so it's another weapon against those irritating whooper wills that flock to investigators during the Dunwich Legacy campaign or Union and Disillusion. If my hand size dipped below 12, I'd be very hesitant to spend more than one action to trigger this effect in most situations, but never say never. I'm not sold on Forbidden Tome Dark Knowledge in the solo format. There's a good chance that Harvey will sustain some damage from his signature weakness, and it would be great to pawn off some of that on enemies. Unfortunately, unless the enemies at Harvey's location are exhausted, which is highly unlikely given Harvey's below average agility, or they have the aloof keyword, triggering the tome will likely trigger attacks of opportunity. Harvey has quite a bit of health and sanity for an old fellow, but trading blows with enemies is not a position that I want to be in when I'm playing a Seeker. Forbidden Tome Secrets Revealed, on the other hand, is a good option in either solo or multiplayer if, and uh, this is a big if, you're playing the big hand deck that can maintain a 12 plus card hand size consistently. Spending one action to move to a connecting location and discover a clue there without making a skill test is a terrific effect that only gets better at high shroud locations or locations with potentially dangerous effects, such as the haunted keyword from the Circle Undone campaign. This tome has the potential to generate action advantage during a scenario since it's not limited by a predetermined number of secrets or charges. As long as you can keep your hand size at 12, you can take two actions for the cost of one every turn, which is fantastic. If my hand size dropped below 12, I might even consider spending two actions to trigger this tome. I wouldn't be happy about it, but I think there are certain situations where you could justify it because the ability to discover a clue without making a skill test is so powerful. Harvey's starter deck includes two cards that interact with tomes, Witten Green, Hunter of Rare Books, and her level 2 upgrade. I have a soft spot in my heart for Witten because she is such a powerhouse in the Call of Cthulhu LCG. That said, uh, I haven't found the right deck for her yet in the Arkham Horror LCG. There are a couple problems with Witten. First, she costs 4 resources, which is a lot considering her plus 1 intellect bonus is conditional on controlling either a tome or a relic. Now, Witten's reaction does help you find those tomes a relic, but in terms of pure speed and efficiency, she simply can't compete with Dr. Mylan Christopher from the core set, who gives you plus one intellect unconditionally. Witten also comes up short against the other seeker ally in the core set, Research Librarian, in the Tome Hunt. Research Librarian costs half as much of Witten as Witten and fetches you any tome in your deck the moment it hits the table. If you'd like to abuse the Necronomicon, easily the most powerful tome in the game, Research Librarian can fetch it for you on turn one, and you'll still have the resources to pay for it. Sadly, the same can't be said for Witten. The other problem with Witten is that she doesn't really fit that well with the big hand style of deck that Harvey's starter deck encourages you to play. Laboratory Assistant is the ally of choice in that deck, which uh, leaves poor Witten on the outside looking in until you can purchase Miskatonic Archaeology funding which is included in the starter deck, or Charisma from the Essex County Express Mythos Pack. Despite the strikes against Witten, I haven't given up hope on finding a, her a home. Either version of Daisy seems like an obvious choice to play Witten, but there is an undeniable chemistry between Luke Robinson and Witten too. Admittedly, it's a bit of an odd pairing, but Luke starts scenarios with a relic in play, which mitigates Witten's tempo issues. I've also considered ignoring Witten Zero altogether in favor of her level 2 upgrade, perhaps including her in a quote-unquote nerdy deck built around Miskatonic archaeology funding. 
Unfortunately for Witten, I haven't pulled the trigger on that build yet because I still wince when I look at her resource cost. I'd happily pay four resources for Witten's willpower and intellect skill bonuses if they were unconditional. Knowing that I need to draw and play a Tome or Relic before I get any sort of bonus is a bit of a tough sell. The final group of level 0 cards that I'm going to look at are Harvey's Enemy Management Tools. If you need any more evidence that the Investigator Starter Deck product was designed with multiplayer format in mind, this is it. The Nathaniel Cho Starter Deck goes all in on combat at the expense of Investigation because the designers expect you to pair him with an Investigator who will discover the lion's share of clues. Harvey's Starter Deck takes the opposite approach, going all in on Investigation at the expense of combat. Again, the designers expect you to pair Harvey with an investigator who can manage enemies because he has only two options, Disc of Itzamna Zero, a downgrade from its level 2 counterpart in the core set, and Occult Invocation. I'm not a big fan of Disc of Itzamna in solo. It's a little pricey at three resources, and I feel like I'm taking a huge tempo hit whenever I spend an action to play it. All too often it seems a dangerous enemy, such as a Yithian Observer, will spawn on top of you before you draw and or play the disc, at which point the disc is basically useless. The disc is also useless against enemies such as the ubiquitous Acolyte from the core set that don't spawn at your location. The disc might have been more helpful in these situations if it had a better spread of skill icons, but a, a single combat skill icon isn't going to help a seeker like Harvey, who is notoriously weak in the combat department. Disc of its Amna Zero suffers from the same drawbacks as its level 2 counterpart, it's a little expensive, and you've got to play it before the enemy spawns on you to be effective. Again, it's no help if the enemy spawns elsewhere. Automatically evading an enemy or dealing two damage to it isn't quite as powerful as discarding an enemy outright, but it can be functionally equivalent if the enemy has two or fewer health or lacks the hunter keyword. As for Occult Invocation, I've played it in a variety of Seeker decks, and it's a good alternative to I've Got a Plan Zero if you've got the card draw to support it. Spending two resources and discarding up to two cards from your hand is a steep price to pay, but Seekers don't have that many options at level zero to deal damage, so beggars really can't be choosers. Occult Invocation tops out at three damage, which is fine for spot removal of run-of-the-mill enemies with two or three health. However, it comes up short against enemies with four or five health, such as the friendly neighborhood Ghoul Priest from The Gathering. Unless you have a follow-up in your hand, which would need to be a second copy of Occult Invocation if you're playing the starter deck out of the box, then dealing those final two points of damage will be tough. Before I wrap up this video, I'd like to talk about the upgrades that you can purchase once you earn some experience points. How you modify Harvey's deck depends a lot on whether you're playing multiplayer or solo and whether you have access to the card pool at large or just the cards in the starter deck. If you're interested in taking Harvey for a spin in the solo format and you have access to the card pool at large, your first order of business should be to upgrade Harvey's enemy management tools. There are plenty of great options in the Seeker card pool, including Strange Solution, Acidic Icker, Arcane Glyph's Prophecy Foretold, Ancient Stone, Knowledges of the Elders, Pendant of the Queen, and last but not least, the Necronomicon. If you prefer the multiplayer format, discovering clues as efficiently as possible takes priority, Again, if you have access to the Seeker card pool at large, there are some great options, including Archaic Glyphs, Guiding Stones, Deciphered Reality, Pendant of the Queen, and again, the Necronomicon. If you're playing Harvey Walters out of the box and you're restricted to upgrades from the starter deck, then you still have a few interesting options. Let's begin with the elephant in the room, the Necronomicon. The Necronomicon is the best tome in the game, period. Free triggered abilities are amazing, and the Necronomicon gives you four that you can mix and match as you see fit. If you want to abuse the Necronomicon, purchase two copies of Library Docent 1, which can bounce the Necronom back to your hand so you can play it again, fully recharged. The Necronomicon is flat out busted when you have access to a larger card pool. If you ignore the optional list of taboos, you can unleash the Necronomicon's terrible power repeatedly by playing it in combination with Knowledge's power, and two copies of Sleight of Hand, which Harvey can pick up by purchasing two copies of Versatile. Abiding by the list of taboos tones down the abuse a little by removing Sleight of Hand from the mix. The Necronomicon and Knowledge's Power also cost slightly more experience, which means it will take you a little longer to assemble the combination during a campaign. It does nothing to rein in the power, though. 
You know you've got a problem card on your hand when you can deal 9 damage to an enemy or discover 4 clues at any location without taking a single action, making a single skill test, or spending any resources during your turn. If you avoid the temptation to snap up the Necronomicon for 5 to 8 XP, depending on of course whether you're playing with the optional list of taboos, then you can explore some of the other options included in the starter deck. One of the first upgrades that many players purchase is Charisma, a permanent from the Essex County Express that provides an extra ally slot. Charisma was not reprinted in the starter deck products, but Harvey's deck includes an alternative in Miskatonic Archaeology funding. It costs one more XP than Charisma, but provides two additional ally slots as long as those slots are occupied by Miskatonic assets, such as the Laboratory Assistant, Witten Green, or Library Docent 1. The card's forced effect prevents you from assigning more than one damage or horror to those assets when you take damage or horror, but that was never much of a concern during testing. I haven't tested the Seeker deck that assembles a small army of nerds to take on the Mythos, but it seems like an interesting angle to explore. There are nearly a dozen allies with the Miskatonic trait, some of which rank among the most powerful allies in the game. I'd love to be able to work Peter Sylvester into that build, but uh, there aren't many Seekers who can play him without purchasing Versatile first. If you prefer to focus on events rather than allies, Farsight 4 is a great option. As long as you have 8 or more cards in your hand, you can exhaust for Farsight 4 to play events such as Cryptic Writings, Extensive Research, Occult Invocation, Preposterous Sketches, I've Got a Plan 2, and Seeking Answers 2 without taking an action. You must still pay the cost of that event, mind you, but if you can get Farsight 4 down on the table early, it has the potential to generate a lot of action advantage during a scenario. There are plenty of powerful events in the Seeker card pool and beyond, so the value of Farsight 4 only gets better as your collection grows. You need at least 8 cards in your hand to trigger Farsight 4, but that's a much lower bar to achieve than some of the other cards in the deck that reward the big hand strategy. Each Investigator starter deck comes with an upgrade for one of the neutral skills included in the core set. To nobody's surprise, Harvey's deck includes Perception too. Perception is a very good option for Harvey decks, since drawing a card with it during your turn will trigger Harvey's reaction, so he actually gets two cards. Perception too lets Harvey draw three cards as long as he succeeds by two or more during a skill test, which uh, shouldn't be too difficult between Harvey's 5 intellect and the 3 intellect skill icons on the skill card. Drawing 3 cards off a successful skill test is basically the equivalent of playing a cryptic research for half the experience points. That's a pretty good deal. If Harvey plays Perception 2 in combination with Practice Makes Perfect, he has the potential to draw 5 or 6 cards using a single copy of the skill, which is amazing. Other Seekers and Off-Class Seeker Investigators also have the potential to abuse this combination, making Perception 2 a valuable pickup if you're playing Practice Makes Perfect and a few other skills with the Practice trait. Seeking Answers 2 has the potential to be quite good depending on the scenario. First, Seeking Answers 2 lets you discover at least two clues for a single action, which is great from a tempo perspective. Second, it can be extremely valuable in scenarios where you need to keep moving, whether to stay ahead of an enemy, with the Hunter keyword, or reach an objective across the map. The ability to move past a location but still pick up the clues there is very nice indeed if you need to put some distance between yourself and the enemy. Seeking Answers 2 also pairs well with cards such as Barricade or Luke Robinson, who can barricade himself in his Dream Gate and investigate other locations to his heart's content. To top it all off, Seeking Answers 2 has two agility skill icons, Seekers tend to fall back on agility rather than combat if their enemy management options are running thin, so those two agility skill icons can be invaluable. Esoteric Atlas 2 is an upgrade for Esoteric Atlas 1, which was released in the Union and Disillusion Mythos pack. Extra movement can be critical to completing scenarios. Unfortunately for Esoteric Atlas 1 and 2, Seekers have some of the best movement cards in the game in Shortcut and Pathfinder. Esoteric Atlas 2 is certainly better than its level 1 counterpart since the movement is more flexible, up to 3 connections away, and it doesn't exhaust when you trigger it so you can take a long, desperate lunge towards the objective if necessary. However, you've got to target a revealed location, which is only good if you're backtracking, like in the Doom of Etsley, or running around in circles, like in the Midnight Masks or A Phantom of Truth. Unfortunately, Esoteric Atlas is Harvey's only option out of the box, so do yourself a favor and purchase the Dunwich Legacy expansion and or the Miskatonic Museum for Shortcut and Pathfinder, respectively. The final card I'm going to look at in Harvey's starter deck is Glimpse the Unthinkable One. 
It's a downgrade for Glimpse the Unthinkable 5, which was released in the Before the Black Throne Mythos pack. I kind of glossed over this card at first, but I really quite like Glimpse the, the Unthinkable 1. If you purchase this for Harvey, he gets to draw at least two cards for free. It also has fewer restrictions than a card like, say, Preposterous Sketches. Then Harvey gets to draw X more cards, depending on how many cards from his hand he reshuffles into his deck. That has the potential to be quite powerful if you're looking for answers buried deep in your draw deck. Glimpse the Unthinkable 5 is probably a better option if you're playing a big hand Harvey deck, since he draws until he reaches his maximum hand size, plus 1. But uh, 5 XP is quite a commitment when there are so many fantastic Seeker upgrades and purchases available. Besides, unlike its level 5 counterpart, Glimpse the Unthinkable 1 isn't removed from the game, so Harvey does have a chance to see it again if he draws through his deck. And before I forget, it's also got the Insight trait, so you can pack it in Joe Diamond's Hunch deck. That's going to do it for my look at the Harvey Walters starter deck. I've had a lot of fun playing Harvey, both in multiplayer and solo over the past 6-8 to eight months, and I hope that you will too. That's going to do it for this episode. If you enjoyed what you hear, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. If you need to contact me, I can be reached at manfromlang at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at manfromlang. Until the stars are right, keep your shotgun close and your elder sign closer. Take care out there, and happy investigating.